on today. Um, I just want to start by mentioning something about, about where we finished before lunch here. And um, I explained that this is a controlled Z gate, and I hope it was obvious from earlier discussion, but it's not. Um, to turn that into a C not gate, we just have to think. Um, three, like the two 50-50 beam splitters here and here to implement those Hadamard operations. So that, you know, the, the heart of it is the control Z operation, but to make it control not, just like this, which are these zone two here and here, which do these two things. Is that all? Okay, so in this final hour, um, I'm just gonna give you a, a talk that I gave at a conference in Birmingham last week, and then uh, Nick and Mercedes and maybe Shark and Joe Moy are gonna tell you about a project that they're working on between um, Bristol and Imperial on large-scale architectures for on computing, which hopefully will lead us into a few discussions. So I'm just gonna pretty much race through this talk. It's not gonna be a, uh, it's not really an effort to uh, do more than just give you a flavor of, of what's happening in the latest research area here. So <coughs> let me get on with that. Firstly, um, to thank all of my colleagues at Bristol, we have a center for quantum photonics where we have about 50 uh, research staff and students. And we have a large number of collaborations across across the globe, and I'll try to highlight who the people are involved in the various different bits of work as well. That is, uh, I apologize that I won't be exhausted on that. Um, so of course, these are the, these are the areas of uh, quantum technologies that we're all interested in, secure communication, computation, which I've talked a lot about, and uh, Quantum metrology, which I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about. Um, I think you're certainly familiar with the top two. The idea of quantum metrology is that, um, I guess in, in analog to the, to the uh, motivation for quantum information science in general, is to start from the perspective that, well, measurement is a physical process, and so physics has something to say about the precision with which you can make a measurement, and in particular, it tells us that to reach the ultimate limits of precision, we need to use quantum mechanical systems and quantum mechanical states to achieve that. <coughs> um, and I guess this slide is really an advertisement for um, a photonics approach to all of these things. So I think in, in communication, it's pretty fair to say there's no alternative but photonics for communicating quantum information. For metrology, this is the same sort of interferometer that we've seen a few times here. And as um, discussed with Terry's question, moving that mirror by a fraction of a wavelength changes the interference condition. And so it's trivial to detect sort of 10, 10 nanometer scale displacements of one of those mirrors. So this type of interferometer in the classical regime is one of the most powerful precision measurement tools that we have. And it turns out that if you use entangled states of light, so for example, so-called noon states, where you have a superposition of n photons in this path and n photons in that path, you can make a measurement of the position of this mirror or the spaceship, for example, with, with a precision that beats the standard quantum limit or shot noise limit. The standard quantum limit's a nice, <coughs> nice name because it's not a limit and it's not quantum, um, but that's what you get with classical resources. Um, Likely to be in statistics, and it turns out there's a more fundamental limit that you can reach using quantum systems that's the Heisenberg limit that's, that's driven by uncertain principles. Um, in terms of computation, I, I, I hope that the three or four or five of us will convince you that photonics is a really good way <coughs> to get to that. Um, and then I, I guess it's just an historical fact that in terms of the fundamental science of quantum physics and more recently, quantum information science, photonics has led the way from uh, you know, violation of Bell inequalities in the late 70s and early 80s through to teleportation uh, in the 90s, three, three photon GHZ states and W states, and most recently, eight photon 10. 
the States. And the reason that, it's, that, that it has is the same reason that it's appealing for these technologies. It's a very nice low noise system where it's easy to manipulate things at the single photon level. And I guess what we've been doing at Bristol over the last few years is addressing the problem that's attempted to be articulated here. These are three experiments under these headings. So that's, that's precisely uh, this logic gate here as originally envisaged by Canil, Lafoe and Milburn CSC. Um, you see uh, you control photon coming in here, target photon coming in here, and then these auxiliary photons one and two coming in. <coughs> um, there's many of these quantum interference, this type of quantum interference that we discussed, there's many places where that occurs in that circuit. Um, this is a quantum metrology experiment where uh, we're able to measure this phase shift with a precision that beats the standard quantum limit. And finally, this is an entanglement filter. So this is a device that passes a pair of photons conditional on them having the same polarization without learning what that polarization is. Anyway, the point is more about how these things are realized. For those of you familiar with this, uh, you'll recognize this as an, you know, an optics experiment. For those of you not, this will be meaningless. Um, this is one inch between these holes that you can just about make out which are M6 threads on a one ton vibration isolation table. And the problem is pretty obvious, right? If this is your transistor and it consumes, you know, square feet of a one ton vibration isolation table, you're gonna end up with a very big computer at the end. Uh, this circuit actually is sufficient for what you'd like to do with quantum metrology, but it, uh, you know, it's not very practical for deployment in the field. And actually, even in terms of the fundamental science, this is arguably the most complicated multi-photon circuit that's been realized to date. And it takes clever people like Ryo Okamoto and Tomohisa Nagata uh, something like six to 18 months to get one of these things you know, set up and aligned and take data and so on. So something twice as complicated as that is more than a PhD's worth of research. And in fact, you know, something a hundred or thousands of times more complicated is, is well beyond beyond reach. And so it's this that's motivated us uh, over the last five or six years at Bristol to come up with a solution. The first thing that we did was to um, to realise what are these logic gates all in fibre. Now this, this gate here is not the KLM gate, it's the gate that we went through in detail here, so it's precisely this one, all realised in optical fibre. And the reason that I've stuck it under the communication heading there is that We've also generated those photons in photonic crystal fibre, which is technology that my colleague John Rarity has pioneered at Bristol over the last several years. And I think this is quite appealing in that it's pretty clear that we're going to um, transmit quantum information encoded in photons in fibres. So if we can generate those photons in fibres and do some small scale manipulation of them in fibres, that's very appealing. But in terms of solving the issue of this sort of forest of optical elements on the table, you just replace it, I think, with a you know, bowl of spaghetti of, of optical fibres. And so the cartoon of what we've been working on is uh, shown here, where we use the sort of on-chip monolithic version of optical fibres, waveguides on chip. <coughs> and I, I have to tell you this because I still enjoy it, even though I've said it a few hundred times before. Um, my good friend and colleague Thaddeus Lag from Stanford interrupted me at a workshop in Tokyo when I first showed this picture to say, Jeremy, there's some, um, they look like pretty high loss waveguides. There's a lot of scatter there, you know, there's light coming out all over the place. And I said, thanks, Thaddeus. And for you, here's the uh, very low loss version of those. <laughs> <laughs> the idea is, is pretty simple. Um, that is that you take a silicon wafer, you grow a layer of silica glass on top of it, a layer of slightly higher refractive index silica, and then you use conventional optical lithography to pattern that um, into waveguides, which you then overgrow with a matching layer of silica to form what is essentially a square optical fiber on the chip. Um, and then the idea is that these beam splitters can now be replaced with directional couplers. So if you take two waveguides, and you bring them into proximity with one another such that the evanescent field from one appreciably couples to the other, then by controlling the separation, or in fact in our case, the length of that coupling region, you can control what the reflectivity is. So as you continuously increase the length of that coupling region, um, let's say in a sequence of devices, then you go from 0% reflectivity 
you know, through to one and, and so forth in a geometric fashion. And so you just sort of dial up the length that you want that corresponds to a 50-50 beam splitter or a one third, two third beam splitter and so forth. And the mode that propagates in there looks, looks something like, like this, so just like a fiber. And then uh, using this technology, we've, we've made, again, this, this same C knock that I showed you before, so hopefully you recognize it. Control zero and one modes, target zero and one modes. The, the, the vacuum modes, which are, which are uh, the, the things that come in here, you see that. They're always there. You don't think about them much when you're dealing with bulk optics, but they're quite explicitly there in the integrated optics architecture like this. Anyway, that works very nicely. It works with, uh, I, I guess, using this uh, this type of approach, we've seen uh, n the, this non-classical interference of photons with 100% um, uh, visibility, so 100% fidelity to within small error bars. And we've operated this CNOC gate with a with a fidelity that's above 99%, so putting it into the regime of fault tolerance, which is very appealing. And, you know, I guess going back to this, this quantum interference thing, I explained that, you know, these amplitudes need to be indistinguishable from one another. One of the main distinguishing features is that they're not, that the modes are not exactly the same, so you don't have the two modes perfectly aligned. Well, in a fiber or a waveguide, there is only one mode coming in and one mode coming out. Two modes coming in and two modes coming out. So there's no possibility for misalignment in the spatial degree of freedom, at least, which really helps things dramatically. So we combined a few of these gates to make a, um, a small scale factoring algorithm. It factors 15. Um, we had no idea what those factors were until we did it. it turns out that it's two and seven. Um, Using this metal electrode on the surface here, we're able to thermo-optically change the refractive index of the waveguide beneath it and thereby implement a controllable phase shift. And in doing so, we've done the same sort of four-photon quantum metrology thing that I showed you before. And uh, finally, here's a device uh, for implementing a quantum warp where we bring 21 waveguides into proximity with one another. So just like the directional coupler that I described with two waveguides, we now have 21 waveguides that are all evanescently coupled. And if you send uh, single photons or bright light through there, you get very interesting interference. And if you send pairs of <coughs> photons through there, you get very interesting uh, quantum interference as well. And you'll see in this device that, that uh, all, all of the action goes on in this little part in the middle where they're all coupled. and then. Those 21 waveguides are all separated so that we can couple out of them at the output here. But only we only have access to the central three waveguides on the left-hand side at this edge of the chip, and the other 18 waveguides just terminate at this point here. I'd love to spend a, an hour talking to you just about this stuff, but I don't have the time, so I'll just, just go on to focus on the sort of technology side of things. This is the chip that does the um, that, that implements the the Shaw's factoring algorithm. And there's a few points to note about it. Um, one is that, well, it just factors 15, so there's still a, an issue of scaling this up um, you know, to large-scale useful devices. And you see that there's no there's no knobs or handles or anything on it, so uh, it's just manufactured to do what it does, and it can't be reconfigured to do something else. And although it's a, it's a big step from, you know, consuming sort of a huge area of of bench space, it's still pretty big. In fact, in the integrated optics world, this is about as big as it gets. And you're still going to end up with a very big quantum computer at the end of, of this on this scale. And it's these things that we've been more recently in the last year or so focusing on. And I want to emphasize that this is not just in the context of quantum computing. Here's a schematic of a uh, quantum key distribution system that we've prototyped and patented with Nokia that's designed to allow you to um, communicate to generate a secure key, for example, between your mobile phone and an ATM machine, for example. And it's exactly the same sort of integrated optical circuits that we're using at both ends of that. In the context of um, quantum metrology, here's a, a device that we've used to measure the concentration of a blood protein bovine serum album. And 
by incorporating a microfluidic channel through one arm of one of these interferometers. And so using entangled states of light, we can determine what the concentration of that blood protein is. And again, you see the same sort of structure. And again, in metrology, here's an example where we, where we generate um, uh, the appropriate states using, again, one of these integrated circuits. So all of these things, um, you know, require the same sort of thing. And in fact, we're also uh, in the regime of, of using these things for exploring very fundamental, well, at least at least for us, fundamental aspects of quantum physics. So here, for example, we've shown that you can violate a Bell inequality even when the, there's no shared reference frame between Alice and Bob, and in fact, even if their devices are completely uncalibrated. So this is a theoretical end theoretical result um, that we've then also implemented using the same sort of thing. And it's nice, it's a nice sort of application in that, um, you know, it, it is quite a demanding and challenging task to to, uh, to calibrate these phase shifters and it turns out, at least for this case, you don't need to do it and that will, that will tell you something pretty interesting. So anyway, I guess just, I'm, I'm just going to spend another five minutes um, telling you how uh, how this all works, and then I'm going to hand over to Nick and Mercedes and maybe Jacques and Jean Wei to tell you a bit about this um, this large scale architecture thing. So, in terms of scaling things up, um, this is a really promising approach. That's uh, it's generally applicable to any any sort of architecture that you imagine. You know that um, the majority of quantum algorithms involve controlled unitary operations, large controlled unitary operations, and uh, you may have seen how, for example, a, a Toffoli gate or a doubly controlled knot gate is decomposed into C knot gates, and it's a mess. It's very quickly a mess. Um, and that's part of the issue with scaling up. And what we've shown here is a very simple idea, which is how you can implement controlled, the controlled version of a given quantum operation in exactly the same way as you'd implement it in the uncontrolled way. And it's a, it's a relatively simple idea, but it's very, very uh, powerful, I think. And in fact, we've already used it to do uh, um, phase estimation algorithm and also in a, in a Shor's algorithm. The idea is that here's your control qubit here, and in fact you have many of them, but let's say one here, and then you want to implement this operation here, conditional on the control being in the one state, where you map these inputs from a, from a two-level system to a four-level system, such that uh, if the control is in the one state, they go into the top two levels, and if it's in the zero state, they just stay in the bottom two levels. And it's the same qubit that's encoded in you know, either the bottom two or the top two levels. And then your operation only acts on two of the levels. So very, very simple idea. And then you do the, do the reverse. And I think this is going to be an important um, technology for scale. In terms of reconfigurability, well, it's, here's a device that has eight of those phase shifters on there. So you can see all the electrodes coming in here. And this circuit, I won't go into the detail of it, but it allows you to do pretty well anything you might like to do with two qubits. So you can generate any two, any pure two qubit state of any degree of entanglement from unentangled to maximally entangled and everything in between. <coughs> in terms of miniaturization, there's two approaches. One is a sort of architectural one, where here we use um, multi-mode interference devices to realize a an n-mode beam spinner. So instead of two inputs and two outputs, you can have up to n modes and directly implement um, a beam spinner. Of course, this is a very powerful operation as well in the sense that you know, if you send a single photon in here, this is the generalized Hadamard operation and you end up with a superposition of, uh, of that photon across all the outputs. So this has the potential to dramatically simplify things. The other way to um, miniaturize things is to look at um, different material systems. So in the things that in these devices and these devices, the main limit actually is the, in some sense, the low tech bit, which is how fast you can go around the corner here to come into this device. And that's determined by the confinement of the light in the waveguide. So if you go around a corner too fast, then the light just spills out. And so the minimum radius that you can go around in these silica on silicon devices that, I, that I've talked about so far is around 15 millimeters, and that's really the limitation for how big the device gets and how much you can fit in the chip. In this architecture here, where we're actually guiding light in the silicon itself, um, the minimum 
bend radius is one micron. And so there's a million times higher density of components in this architecture possible than in silica. And in fact, there's many more order, orders of magnitude in going from that first chip that I showed you with the Shaw's factoring algorithm to this than there was in going from the bench top to the to the first to that chip. Um, and then just finally, so far I've, I've only really talked about the chip itself. We've got to generate the photons and detect them so we can get them on and off there. We typically use optical fibers to get photons in and out. We generate photons for all of the things that I've shown you here using spontaneous parametric down conversion, which is a process whereby you shine a bright laser beam into a nonlinear crystal and one of those laser photons can spontaneously split into two daughter photons conserving momentum and energy. So it's a spontaneous source, you don't know when that process is going to happen, but if you detect a photon here, then in principle you know with certainty that there's a photon there. And then we use uh, either commercial avalanche photodiodes for 800 or near visible light, and we use superconducting single photon detectors uh, for 1550 and a meter of telephone wavelength light. And then you have some sort of fast electronics and computer and so forth. And I guess the point of this slide is it's all very well to have some tiny chip, but if you still have to fill a lab with you know, all the, the, the photon source and detectors and control electronics or something, then it's, it's still not really a good solution. And so the ambition is to get all of this onto the same chip. And I, this is a, a cartoon of how you might imagine doing this. So this is waveguide spontaneous parametric down conversion sources. We generate a photon here, and this detec detector here tells you that that photon's there. You have some fast switching network that sends those photons into your highly recomputable circuit, possibly with some sort of delays, and then some sort of uh, output leaves. It's very easy to draw these sort of pictures. The challenge is to actually do it. Um, <coughs> the, just to make it explicit, and I don't know if you guys are going to talk about this a bit, but um, the, the idea here to make these spontaneous sources scalable is to make them deterministic by multiplexing many of them, either in time and or space. So here the idea is that you, know, you send one gigahertz laser pulses in here, you split that up to pump n sources. So any individual source might have a, you know, a 1 or 10% chance of producing a pair of photons. But given that, if you have n sources, there's a very, very small probability that none of them will produce a pair. And then your task is to just pick one of the ones that did produce a pair, which you know from here, and switch the partner using a, a, a switching network into the single output here. Now this is a sort of brute force engineering solution to making an unscalable source scalable, but the appeal of it is that there's no atom-like system, there's no ultra-high vacuum, there's no um, you know, millikelvin temperatures or anything like that. It looks like, a, a, you know, it looks like something that not too dissimilar to what's made in the telecommunications industry already. So that's the first point, is the scale it, scaling it up and manufacturability. And the other thing is that you can really precisely engineer the phase matching conditions and the dispersion in these devices such that you have very precise control over getting a, 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 a very nice photon with a very precisely defined spectrum in the Fourier transform limited pulse at the output, which is in contrast to your typical atom cavity system. So in order to do this, you need these integrated sources, you need some sort of integrated detectors, some delays and so forth, and I'll just quickly show you a few things that, uh, that we've done in that direction. Um, so, so this is a, this is a silicon micro ring, which allows the, light, the, the, the laser light to propagate for a more extended period and produces photon pairs at 1550 on a chip. This is the idea of integrating um, uh, superconducting single photon detectors with that waveguide, and I hope I've got a slide here to show you some other things on that. Um, fast switching, so I talked to you about uh, thermo-optic switching, but that's in intrinsically a slow process, and to you know, make this multiplex source, you need a very fast switching network. And the way to go there is to use some sort of electro-optic effect where an applied electric field directly changes the refractive index of a um, material like lithium diabate and a lot of 3.5 semiconductors. And 
40 gigahertz modulators are standard uh, telecom components in lithium niobate, and 100 gigahertz is um, is being demonstrated in the lab. So that's that's more than fast enough. And here, as promised, uh, are some results from uh, from Andrea Fiore in Eindhoven and a, a collaboration between Yale, Boston, and Moscow State, uh, where they've coupled, and as schematically indicated in the previous slide, uh, superconducting single photon detectors to gallium arsenide waveguides and silicon waveguides. So all of the components are there in terms of you know, sources, circuits, fast switches, and detectors. I'll just briefly explain this. The idea of these types of detectors is that you have a superconducting material. NBN is favoured because it has it forms very nice thin film single crystals on just about anything that you can grow it on, and you pattern that into a, a nano wire that meanders across you know across the surface of the chip, and then you current bias it so that it's near to its critical current. So it's still superconducting, but it's near to the critical current. A single photon comes in uh, and is a gets absorbed by that superconductor, creates a local resistive hotspot that the current then has to divert around, exceeding the, the critical current and giving you a fast voltage spike. And this is a really nice technology for, um, for single photon detectors. Very, very, very fast, very low dark counts, very robust, um, and it looks, looks like the uh, promising solution. So I think now I'm going to hand over to these guys and they're going to tell you, all right, so here's all the components, how do you actually put it all together, where's, you know, a, a blueprint, if you like. I'll get rid of this set. to um, linear optics. So the difference between cluster computation and the normal circuit model is that you or you start with a resource state. In this case, so the resource state, we can draw it like this, where each block represents a qubit and each, um, each line represents a CZ gate, so the entangling gate between the, those two qubits. Um, this is the best way of representing them because the, the general form of the cluster state is, is not, not very efficiently written in any standard vector. Um, so how? So once you have a resource state, you would um, tailor its. You would shape it by applying different poly poly gates to it, and then do a set of measurements, which are single um, single qubit measurements, to get your result. And the advantage this have is that if you if you have a probabilistic gates like we do in linear optics. Um, you, you have the chance of the, the gate going wrong. But if we build a cluster state and start with it, we only have to apply single qubit gates, and we've already seen that we can apply those deterministically. So if we find a way of building the cluster state, then we'll be able to do um, co quantum computation. Yep. All right, so as we said, there's, sort of the, there's sort of four aspects that we're considering. You said that we need to build a cluster state, so we need to decide which resource we're going to start with. So we've got these sort of four problems. The first one is um, actually creating the resource states we need. And those resource states then go into sort of building of the cluster state.
once we've got the cluster state, that's this big entangled mess, um, then all we need to do is some measurement and some classical processing. So I guess I'm going to talk a bit about the actual experimental, the, the ways we're actually going to do these four steps and uh, the difficulties you might have, but also how we're in linear optics quite well positioned for realizing this sort of scheme. So as Jeremy and Mercedes has already mentioned, the measurement is quite easy. We apply some single qubit gates and then stick them in single photon detectors. Jeremy's last slide had some single photon detectors that work on a waveguide chip. They're very small, they're very scalable, and they work with 94% efficiency. We can assume that's only going to go up. We, as we take our time working on all the rest of it. The classical control um, is, well, it's classical computing. We might need it to be really fast, but that's, again, an engineering problem. And how difficult this problem is depends exactly on how we do these steps. So that leaves us with the two top problems on here. There's a, a slightly more tricky, I guess, but um, I'll start with the resource states. Ultimately, our resource states are single photons. Jeremy's already explained by multiplexing how we can get a, essentially by an engineering solution, get a deterministic source of single photons from the probabilistic process of of uh, spontaneous parametric down conversion. So let's assume that that's, that's done, that's solved. We can get a push-button push source where you tell it you want a single photon, and you get one. Probably a gigahertz kind of rate, so that's good. These then need to go into something a little bit bigger. And we're using as our uh, intermediate GHZ states. Those are going to be what I'm referring to as our resource. Um, the true thing of why do we go first to single photons and then to GZ states is because um, there's a subtlety of how is the, uh, the entanglement of this cluster state. So the entanglement, the entanglement of this cluster state has to have maximum, so it has to be um, a scale maximally with a number of, of qubits. So that means that not all entang uh, entangled clusters, um, entangled um, states, are good for. Uh, our cluster state to be a universal resource for quantum computation. So, um, for instance, um, GSS states have this property of maximally scaling of entanglement. So they're really good for uh, building the cluster state, but um, other states like W states would not be good for it. So the way we would, good, um, we would go about doing this is first start with a GSS state and produce them as a resource state ballistically. Uh, in a scheme that works with a certain probability, but we can set up our experiments so that once our, our chip or our has produced a GSS state, we know it's there, and we can route it to the rest of the experiment and use it. Um, so you would say, so why, why do we go from single photons to GSS and from GSS to a big cluster state? Well, because um, as we said, the CSET gates we, we are implementing in linear optics, they're probabilistic. They don't work all the time. So we, we run the risk of, while trying to attach a new qubit to our cluster state, actually removing some of other qubits. And in that way, we will be destroying our system rather than making it bigger. However, if we start with, um, with the GSET states and then use some fusion gates, to, that Jeremy mentioned, um, to put those states together, it actually turns out that yes, some of the time our gates will not um, work and we'll lose some qubits, but um, we actually end up with a positive probability of growing our, our cluster state. So if we wait for a long enough period of time, we'll have built a big enough chunk of our cluster to start our computation. So I've just written a sort of schematic using Jeremy's linear optical network notation um, to um, sort of, roughly speaking, Mercedes Post deals with this in a lot more detail. 
have a chance to have a look at that and ask questions later, I suppose. But to generate an n photon GH dead state, we need two n photons as an input. We herald on n of these photons, so we put them into a detector. And subject to the state that we detect, we've got a probability that looks like it gets pretty small pretty quickly. Um, but with some non-zero probability, we get out of n photon GH dead state. And this scaling is horrible, but our resource states are probably only going to be about four or five photons, which makes it tractable for, for our purposes. After that, we use the same trick as we did for the non-deterministic single photon by just multiplexing it up. So we stick them into one of these multiplexers. Depending on which one of these works, we switch the state into where we want it to be. It's kind of messy, but ultimately just engineering. Yeah, and actually for for, uh, particularly for four photon GHZ state, this way of producing GHZ state is better, like, is to, produ to produce it with a better probability of success than <coughs> any other way we've come up with to build it. So even though the probability of four photons would be one over 128, um, and that seems pretty daunting, but with the, with the, um, with our, our ability of using a lot of photons and then multiplexing, this turns out to be the, the optimal, as far as we know at the time, to produce this GSS state. And obviously, there's going to be a trade off in um, how big are our resource state and how many fusion gates are we going to need for our cluster. So, this, this boundary is actually not very sharp. It's, we, ha we still have to find the optimal. Um, size of research state, size of the building class of the of the cluster, and also the geometry that's going to help us to do our, our computation better. That's right. So let's get into some of these. Sorry, questions. What happens if a welding gate doesn't work? If one of these gates doesn't work, if a welding gate, yeah. What uh, oh, a fusion gate. Yeah. I will go into that. Um, yeah, I'm probably going to get into that. So oh, you can yeah. ask again in ten minutes if I still have an answer to the question. <laughs> <laughs> so. Um, yeah, all in stick diagrams. Our GH dead state looks like this in our notation. We've got five photons. It's a five photon GH dead state. For more photons, you just draw more um, satellites onto the, the central one. And it's a maximally entangled state. If we want to, our fusion gates take two of these. And there's two types of fusion, um, but we'll use type 2 fusion. So if I perform type 2 fusion on that, the outcome is a bigger entangled state. And that is with 50% probability. That will be important later. But from just from this simple operation, you can probably see how we would go about getting from GHZ states of this form to a square lattice. If we then fuse some more onto the bottom here, then we can make this look like this and just start to build the whole thing up into a lattice. Um, with this slight problem, which as I said I will come back to. And this this is going to take on to translation. Yes, you want to deal with that? Or? Yeah, yeah. Um, so I said before that when you were dealing with cluster state computation, you take, let's say, a, re a perfect ideal resource state like this, and then you're going to shape it by applying some po um, poly gates. So um, uh, in this case, for instance, if you apply a, a set um, gate of set measurement, then you would effectively, effectively remove that qubit and all its connections from your cluster. So you see how this way we can make holes in, the, in our cluster and then define the path we're going to do our measurements on. But what happens if it's the other way around, which is exactly our case? So as Mihai asked before, what happens if one of our gates doesn't work? So imagine I'm trying to fuse, yeah, thank you. So I'm trying to, you know, I'm, I'm doing the fusions and then, well, some of my um, gates don't work, so I, don't, I lose some entanglement, some of these bonds. Or, you know, I, I lose some of the photons because that actually can happen. So then I'm gonna start having, um, holes in my lattice. And so this is exactly the opposite case of what I was mentioning before. In this case, we're not given a perfect cluster and then we shape it to do our computation. We're given an imperfect cluster and the task is the opposite. We have to find a path for which 
our, uh, a path that would go from one side to the other of the cluster and in which we can do all our measurements and then do the computation. So um, the way we, we can think about this is about brain normalization. So imagine we have a blob like this of class and then we have some, some links missing, some um, bonds missing, and then we say, okay, is there a path through this cluster that if I just imagine this whole thing like being one one side of my big cluster, if I make if I connect this to other sides, can I find a path through this cluster state that would get me to the next one? In this case, we could do something like this, and we say yes, we can find that path. That way, that means that we can do computation through this. This lattice. And that's one of the things that we're going to need classical control for. So this is called percolation because if you could imagine like when water goes through sand, it has to find a path to get to the other end. It's exactly that. We have to find a path to do our computation. And um, there are already some pathfinding algorithms readily available, but we're ha going to have to implement that in our classical control. And also taking into account that this all this setup is, is dynamic. So it's not like our photons are just sitting there and uh, we, just, we just know the ones that are lost and, well, we just go around it. Like we have to make it fast enough because all our photons are being stored in waveguides and those waveguides are not completely transparent. So at some point, all these photons have a likelihood to be absorbed. So we have to make classical control really fast to, you know, um, make sure that we can find the path and do our measurements and not lose our photons in the meantime. So this is one of the challenges that you know, we're facing apart from obviously other technological challenges. I think um, you know, um, another point that's actually essential to this is that the fusion gates are heralded. That is, we do know when they have worked and when they haven't. So we know exactly where these... Work, you just project on the Sorry? Do you lose everything when they don't work, or do you just project one of the kidneys on that? Yeah, you, you just project one you of project, the kidneys. Yes. The one that you wanted to work to? Yeah, so basically, uh, if, the, um, if the fusion doesn't work, you, you lose that qubit, but you don't lose everything you've built so far. So, and actually, that's why you have a positive probability of growing your state over time. So I think I'll go on to a sort of get to the actual architecture, which is what Jeremy was, I think, hoping to talk about. <laughs> Try and go through that very quickly. <coughs> got those. Uh, haven't got them, but the basics. Then try to sketch this out. <laughs> Hopefully, it won't take too long. <laughs> the, so we start with our single photons. Okay, I'm missing out a step here. There's a multiplexing step, so we actually have deterministic single photons. And I sort of put these into GHZ boxes. <coughs> then I, we, we go to another step of multiplexing. So now we have what is essentially a GHZ state out here, deterministic GHZ state. So you can see that although this is quite a daunting task, it's really big, it, it is possible. We've got, the, we, we've got the knowledge of how to do it and arguably got most of the technology um, to, to make, this, make this happen. So we have a deterministic GHZ source. And now we need to switch these into some kind of network which will grow a cluster. So I'll just go over here and sort of sketch out how that is going to work. Drawing these balls and sticks gets really tedious. I should have done as Mercedes did and prepared one in advance. Blue Pete away. Okay, so here's a section of incomplete cluster states. 
and these are those in the jump. Thank you. These are the remaining sort of satellite ones which are to be fused and won't play any more part. And let's say I have a the next JHL state that I want to fuse into it is is here. Number those to make it kind of obvious what's happening, and you can see that we need to fuse these two. This was four, this was three, and we need to fuse those two together. And that's how we add another qubit to our cluster. Um, so, what makes this task simpler is the fact that fours and twos always go together, ones and threes always go together. So, let's say that we have this sort of here, we label this as a one, two, three, and four. We need to make sure that the three from the previous, the three is delayed by some time. And this is the the rate repetition rate of our source. Um, and that goes and joins with the one in the type 2 fusion gate. Um, the 2 has the fuse of the 4, which has been delayed by a longer time. Um, so this is doing these two fusion operations. The 0 qubit from our GHZ state is what is <laughs> <laughs> okay, so so the zero qubit is what actually ends up in our lattice. So we take this away and put it into a big storage loop, um, and then we have our measurement box. Maybe you need to make it clear that those fusions are between copies of that GHC can be displaced just in case it's not Yes, I suppose that's what the... Um, because this GHC is producing photons at a certain but pretty fast repetition rate, you can imagine that there's one in it here, one in it there. Um, the, this one then comes down um, goes into a storage loop, that one here, and then this is the one that was produced before that one, that gets fused with that. So in this way we're achieving the fact that the three from this GHZ state is fused with the one from this incoming one. The two from this GHZ state is fused with the four from a way previous GHZ state. And yeah, we don't, we don't just fuse the same satellites from one GHZ state to the whole cluster. Um, and this is what I think we're going to have to start calling the Silverstone scheme after after Josh, who sort of wrote it down. Um, but it kind of demonstrates how straightforward everything is once we've got these GHZ sources. It's essentially projecting all the complexity of quantum computation into this box here. And I hope I've convinced you that it's hard, but somewhat feasible that we might actually be able to do that. And uh, I think that one of the other things about this, so building this class is that, um, so with linear optics we have to, we don't, we don't, we don't have to worry about full tolerance, but we also have to worry about loss tolerance and, and we know you were, we're going to miss some photons because they get absorbed or because our, put, our detectors are not perfect, etc. So um, the thing is, um, this well, at the moment this is drawn to build a square lattice. But the thing is, adding different different delays to different photons, we can basically build any geometry. So we can develop theoretical models to deal with both fault tolerance and to loss tolerance, and then implement them very, really easily just by changing how much any yeah. photon gets laid. So this is a very flexible scheme to adapt to a theoretical model, which makes it like really good for the work I'm trying to do. Yeah. The only reason I've drawn a square lattice is because I can draw it. <laughs>
lose a qubit entirely. And this is our sort of probability of fusion working. And there's a sort of line on here, um, which, which yeah, that way. it is that way, yeah. yeah. And this, in this region, um, you're OK. You've got a high probability that there will be a crossing cluster. In this region, you can't do it. So for a square lattice, um, this intersection is actually at 0.5, so we kind of can't use a square lattice. But for other geometries, then it gets it gets more feasible. Maybe just like a 3D, but it's just kind of like a yeah, yeah, a cubic <coughs> for a cubic lattice, this is about um, 0.3 or something. So you don't need a very high probability of your fusion gates working, subject to not having really high loss anyway. I'm pretty sure this is not actually right around. I think this is the probability of keeping your place on, not lots, okay. but you yeah. get the general idea. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I've got a couple of quite frivolous questions for you. But, um, okay. So, one of them is uh, so you obviously this is all about quality of right? As far as I can understand it, it's tolerance against basically quantum saturation, right? Like the loss of bronze, but whatever we used to call it, it's a bit different to Okay. Um, have you ever tried, or would you ever consider trying actually seeing how robust these kinds of devices are for putting things like the mark right around the computer floor? I'm not, I mean, I'm, I'm not saying there's no <coughs> reason for doing it other than bragging about it afterwards. If you are. Huh? But I can see it in the field, maybe, I mean, if you actually are going to deploy these things as devices, you can imagine they're bringing them to your radio to see it kind of stretching their things like this. Sure. Um, one, of the, one of the issues, I guess, is that as far as temperature fluctuations, for example, go, then for it to make a cause us a large problem, um, Jeremy mentioned that you can, our uh, waveguides have a refractive index that depends on temperature. That's mm -hmm. pretty unavoidable, that thermological yeah. effect. So you can imagine temperature fluctuations causing these big problems. But it only causes any kind of decoherence and loss of quantum states if those temperature fluctuations are happening on a time scale faster than the repetition rate of our source. So doesn't it, it wouldn't I mean do they not turn your fifty fifty beam spheres into not fifty fifty beam by either stretching or changing the back of the next time? It doesn't actually change it that much. If you okay. make an effort like if you put one of those electrodes above a couple you can change it by a few percent by seriously thinking it. And the other thing to say is that it's really temperature gradients is you yeah. to that really matter in the sense that you know, if you have an interferometer, then the whole thing moves up and down in temperature, then both arms change together, and that's fine. And I, that's really the appeal of this sort of modern ethical approach. You actually have to bring a special effort to achieve such a gradient. Because the length scale is so small, and the gradient that changes across the chip is quite a serious gradient. Well, I guess if we were trying to market such a device, then we'd have to go through some serious testing. That's uh, probably not going to happen during my PhD. Probably at that. And how it? Uh, yeah. So you talked about maybe using, say, a cubic lattice. Yeah. So that'd be that need a set of protons in each, let's say, rather than a five. Yes, it would. How badly does that scale? Well, as I said, in <laughs> this scheme here has a yeah. probability of one over two to the two n, so it scales. Yeah, but you can also produce um, gear set states that are smaller uh, and then fuse them together to produce one that's bigger. 
yeah. so, and then using those to build your actions. So, so basically, uh, the ballistic um, that has proven to success for the ballistic um, scheme that you can combine ballistic scheme with uh, fusion and multiplexing, that thereby like obtaining better success probabilities. Yeah, it's actually one of the active areas of our research on this. Mercedes and Gabriel, who's not here at the moment, is to work out what the optimal strategy for generating a GHS state of certain size is. And the sort of probability of this working goes down exponentially. There's other probability schemes that go down sort of start out worse and have a better exponential. And I think that there's some which are polynomial um, and they're very large. Yeah. Right, static is yeah. pretty good. So yeah, we've got our, if we need really big GHS states, we wouldn't do it in this way, but... Yeah, but this, this is definitely something that you could use as a stepping stone for, for doing something like that. Any more questions? Oh, so there's some time then. Yeah, there's time again.